of your screen. We'll attempt to answer your questions throughout the presentation if we can, but most likely we'll do them at the end. Also, I may share some info with you tonight um, and you can check that out in the chat box. At this time, I'd like to thank a few people and organizations. First, we'd like to give thanks to The Mill, one of our sponsors of tonight's lecture. The Mill is a family owned local business with seven locations in Harford, Baltimore, Carroll and Kent counties, as well as York County, PA. They carry everything you need for pets, livestock, wildlife watching and lawn and gardening, gardening, including pots and beautiful plants for container gardening. And don't forget seasonal decorations and display items. You can check, that, check them out at themillstores.com. Thanks, Brendan Henry, and thanks to all the Mill staff. We also give a big thanks to our sponsors for the entire lecture series. They are Muffin and Sam Dell, longtime Ledoux members and supporters. Thanks, Muffin and Sam. And of course, the Manor Conservancy, specifically Executive Director Renee Hamidi and Conservancy members Bob Bowie and Susan Chase. The Manor Conservancy works to preserve the rural character of Northern Baltimore and Harford counties to resist the spread of development and sprawl, to guard the water and air quality, and to support and encourage group activities intent on improving the environment. You can learn more about them at themanorconservancy.org. Lastly, we want to thank the Jet Rock Corporation for being such a good neighbor and allowing us to use their facilities here in Maryland to broadcast from tonight. Jet Rock is a nationwide provider of commercial flooring solutions with an amazing overnight technology. You can learn more about them at jetrockinc.com. Now on to today's presenter, Dan Benarsik. We're very happy to welcome Dan back, who's spoken for Ledoux a couple times now. Dan has graduated from the University of Delaware with a Bachelor of Science degree in plant science. Fresh from the university, he started work at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, dedicated to the research and protection of native plants. In 1993, he began working at Chanticleer Garden in Wayne, PA. He currently oversees the Chanticleer's courtyard gardens with an emphasis on tropical, subtropical, and tender perennials for seasonal display. Dan is part of the continuing education program at Longwood Gardens, and he has served on the plant selection committee for the Delaware Center for Horticulture's Rare Plant Auction. Today, Dan will share his passion for container gardens and how you can create magnificent, long lasting combinations with elements of surprise. He will show you how to use different types of pots and plants to create impressive garden containers, whether you're a beginner or advanced gardener. Please welcome Dan Benarsik. Thank you very much, Cheryl. <clears throat> it's welcome. a pleasure to be here. I hope everybody can hear me. I hope everyone can see me. Um, you knew you were, what you were getting into when you signed up to see me, so here you are. I too uh, do want to say a few thank yous. Thank you to Cheryl. Thank you to Hallie, who's helping us coordinate this. Thank you to Ledoux Gardens. Um, always wonderful to visit the gardens. I wish I could be there now, but I think we, we all wish we could be there now. But we're making the uh, make do with the best we can. But also uh, to my dear friend Muffin, who's co-sponsoring this, and to the mill. Um, interestingly enough, I was introduced to the mill in their Chestertown site, and a dear friend of mine, Cindy King, manages the garden center at the Chestertown site, and uh, I, uh, I love, I, I, every time I'm down on the eastern shore, I always stop in, and I, I just can't help but buy something down there, so great people, great operations, support our sponsors, and um, thank you again for having me. So without any further ado, let's talk about what we came to discuss today. There we go. Oh, pardon me. We're here to talk about containers today, <clears throat> or I like to call them artistic flourishes. Pots with a purpose is a talk that I've given for, well, quite a few years. And Cheryl just reminded me, well, I think she told you and reminded me that I've been at Chanticleer for almost, well, this is my 28th season. And uh, a good 25 of those years, I have been working uh, in the container, excuse me, in the courtyard spaces, there we go, of, of Chanticleer. Now, for those of you that have visited, you realize that there are some homes on the property and each of those have uh, courtyard spaces that um, are, pertain to each of those buildings. And over the years, I have managed each of those spaces. Um, 
So some of these will look familiar to you. And if they don't look familiar to you, we, we encourage you to visit. Uh, we are just uh, zeroing in on about the last 10 days of our open season. We open essentially April 1st, a little bit later this year, um, to the end of October. And in this, in this case, we'll be closing Sunday, November 1st. We are closed for the winter, but we very much plan on being open again early April of next season. So if you have visited, we welcome you back. If you've not visited, we implore you to come back and visit. But in these courtyard spaces, I do utilize a lot of containers. Here's a wonderful example of an old entry courtyard. Many years ago, this was the primary entrance to the garden, but as numbers grew, um, the volume and of our guests grew as well. And we, we, we rearranged our visitors, uh, visitor services uh, kiosk. Uh, so this is now a quiet, a more intimate entrance into the garden, but it was an old laundry courtyard. And as such, there are no beds. This was a paved space enclosed on all four sides, a utilitarian space. But as a public garden, we opened it up uh, with the gates and, and, entrance and entrance and exit to it. But the point is, any horticulture that takes place has to take place in a container. Okay, it has been my style, my aesthetic to work with tropical plants, tender perennials, perennials, woody plants in combination. But due to the fact that we're gardening in zone six, seven, right there on the line, uh, these tropicals don't overwinter. Of course they don't. They're, they're no more suited to overwintering than where you are. Um, so these containers need to be replanted, reinvented, reimagined every year. And as such, it allows me to put out a new and different display every year, which I really enjoy. Now, as we sort of just take a quick walk through uh, Chanticleer, I want you to understand that those ideas, those concepts, the, uh, the ideas that I'm sharing with you pertain also to hanging baskets as well as window boxes, for example. So I, I'm really stretching that idea of containers and what is a container. Um, these are just some wonderful hanging baskets. Uh, we have a row of four of them against the main house, Chanticleer proper. And every year those two are reimagined with seasonal, uh, seasonal plants. Um, when I was maintaining this area a few years ago, um, I, I just still love this image. It was one of those years where everything just seemed to work right. And I was very proud of that. Um, but I do love the baskets. I love the fact that baskets, um, you know, you, you generally the baskets are hanging and what it does is it changes that perspective. So often we look at plants down on them in beds or lower containers, but when the perspective is changed and you bring, and you bring a basket up to eye level, you really sort of, you have a whole nother perspective on the plant. And I think detail and execution is, is vital at that point because, well, it's harder to hide the flaws and the mistakes. Um, but I do enjoy that juxtaposition of, of plants in containers on the ground, as well as plants in containers in the air, if you will. Even early in the season, the very same basket. If you, we'll dwell on this a little bit later, but I just wanted to point this out. I realized the slide came a little early in the talk. Um, the basket is one of the heavy duty um, hanging baskets. I believe we purchased this from Kinsman and Company, a mail order horticulture supply house. Um, big heavy gauge uh, metal uh, with a vinyl or a plastic coating around them for great durability. The only problem is the space between those ribs of the basket is quite large, in some places four to five inches. And it takes quite a bit of material to span that space to hold the soil in. I've tried cocoa fiber and sphagnum moss, and I, I wasn't in love with any of those. So one of the things we have a lot of in the spring landscape are branches. Our willows, our smoke bushes, our uh, shrubby dogwoods are generally cut back in late winter as good protocol uh, in the garden. Uh, it yields us these branches. So I, I like to take the willow branches mainly because they're so supple and weave them very simply uh, between the ribs of these baskets. And you can see how I, I did that. Um, the, yeah, I did take the, I, I'm, putting my basket weaving classes at the university to good use right here. Um, but the point was to just span those, those gaps in the basket to hold the soil, but also early in the season, 
when the plants are small and insignificant and just getting started, it gives the basket an extra level of interest, a little pizzazz. As the plants grow and as the plants establish, the vibrancy of those stems begins to soften and then goes almost neutral brown for most of the season. So the focal point changes from the vibrancy of the branches early to the plants in the basket, as it should later in the season. More of the courtyard spaces. I love the heat of summer, mixing our tropicals with some edibles. This is a wonderful variegated curcuma, um, turmeric, if you will. This year we uh, put an emphasis on edibles and consumables in our garden. Um, I think we had to recenter ourselves and see what was really important in terms of public gardens and, and display and um, how we could do our part. And one step in that direction was to plant these edibles and consumables. But of course, I had to plant the ones that had a little bit more interest in them. So instead of just planting turmeric, I wanted the variegated turmeric. And let me tell you, I'm very, very happy with it. It thrives in the hot, humid summers, uh, just as that, uh, that canna does. Um, we'll, we're going to see this canna in several other images. But I just want to point out this one specifically as a favorite of mine. Number one, it's orange. Orange is my color. It's my happy place. I know a lot of people have problems with orange. That's okay. I don't. I love it. I wouldn't garden without orange. But this is a selection called Orange Punch. All right. There's a lot of, like I say, different oranges out there. But it, to me, it is one of the, the purest oranges. Uh, the health of the plant is generally good. And uh, the, the flowers have a slightly pendulous habit, which some people might say, I don't really like that, uh, but um, I, I like that pendulous aspect to the, to the flowers. We're talking about the heat of summer. That is one thing we do have there in the mid-Atlantic. So let's put it to use for us. Um, tropicals will not overwinter. We've already discussed that. We know that we've all had those, uh, those sad experiments that didn't work. But when they work, they work well, all right? In this case, the Ancete, which is a banana relative, not a true banana, but a banana cousin. Um, the Ancete ventricosum, that selection is called Morali, which has the red stem, uh, excuse me, the red um, midrib on the leaves, uh, which is really distinctive of that selection but it just loves the heat of summer. And, you know, a few years ago, you would have to trade many dollars or vital organs to get a plant like this. But now with tissue culture and production, you, we can get these plants early in the season, a reasonable size, put them in the ground, good compost, good light, good moisture, fertilize them, mulch them with osmocote, as a friend of mine used to say, and uh, they just reward you with explosive growth. Back to that kitchen courtyard. Um, maybe it went a little overboard that season, but you know, I like to say nothing succeeds like excess, right? This is gardening. Let's have fun with it. Winters are long and cold. Let's enjoy it in the summertime. So there's a can of orange punch again in the pots. Um, there's a series of four pots there to the left. Uh, one of my favorite container plants, Dichondra Silver Falls. Uh, it's a tiny leaf, little abundant spreader, but it's also a cascader when you need it. But one of the points I wanted to illustrate was that staircase, that awkward staircase that I have in this courtyard space. And some people had always considered that a real, um, a real problem, a real disadvantage. And I just, I just changed my thinking about that. And I said, how can I creatively work that staircase into the aesthetic. And you know, those tiny little steps, those shallow steps, perfect little shelves for containers. So containers in that case helped me to solve the issue. Yes, I run a vine up there. I think it was Jasmine the year this picture was taken, but those variegated geranium um, could be any other plant, but you know, cascading up and therefore down those stairs, I think was a wonderful selection or solution to that problem. This is one of those cases where I think it was the right place and the right time. Um, I just took this picture. I was not the best picture in the world, but as a picture that I was always very happy with and very proud of. Uh, this was one of the reflection pools in a quiet area, Chanticleer. Uh, just like I say, you can just create mood. Um, in our seasonal courtyard gardens, it's as much about theater as it is about horticulture. These are just moments in time you know, people don't really live like this 
very much in the world these days. But when you can step into a place and immerse yourself in that situation, it is kind of fun. So we were talking about the heat of summer, but you know, it, it doesn't start that way. Let's, let's take a look in and see what a few things we do in the springtime. Myself and several of the other horticulturists at Chanticleer, we do a lot with forced bulbs. Um, this is our visitor services kiosk, the entrance, essentially the first uh, thing you see when you show up. Uh, we open April 1st, and let me tell you, we don't go frost free until about May 15. So we have to do plenty of shuffling in the springtime to keep interest. David Mattern, uh, my horticulturist companion who manages one of the other uh, courtyard areas, uh, has a sun porch with a mantle, an exterior, a fireplace and mantle on it. And he forces wonderful little pots of bulbs. And these are changed out as they pass, new ones come on. It's a very informal um, display technique, but I have always feel very comfortable with that. And I love his aesthetic. He's got what I call a, a jewel box aesthetic. I tend to be bigger and bolder. David tends to be more detail oriented. And in that way, we don't really compete with aesthetics, but we complement each other in that way. One of the things I like to do in the springtime, I really weigh heavily on the uh, cool season annuals and perennials, the violas and osteospermums, for example. They love the cool, bright weather of springtime, okay? Um, not dependably hardy plants, but very tolerant of cool spring. And then I like to incorporate some of the vegetables, the cool season vegetables. In the rear pot there, the wonderful giant mustard, uh, red giant. Um, it is a delicious mustard um, foliage if to slice and put into a salad, but I dig it for the texture. Look at the color and the texture of those leaves. And again, completely tolerant of cool weather, cool evenings, uh, springtime. And it really doesn't begin to bolt until about June. And by that point, I'm changing over for my seasonal displays anyway. So like I say, I mix it up with a lot of different things. Flowers, cool season perennials and annuals, um, but vegetables on the front, the, the, the foremost pot, frontmost pot there, uh, the variegated thymes and some carrots. But think about those cool season herbs and vegetables as well. Quiet little pocket at Chanticleer, just a little uh, pop of air in there. I believe that one is champagne bubbles. It's a mix, a color mix of poppies. There's, there's something about poppies in the springtime. And well, I guess the answer is pretty simple. There's so much orange in those poppies. How could I go wrong? Um, but they bring me peace in the springtime. It really does. It sort of warms my heart. And um, I always enjoy seeing them. In this season, uh, David integrated the poppies with branches. And some of you may say, oh, it's, it looks a little twiggy. It looks a little ratty. Well, early in the season, we, we, we're, looking for, we're looking for foils. We're looking for something else. I had mentioned the willow stems uh, early on. Uh, this is Salix britsensis flame. And flame is known, oh, pardon me, I'm gonna jump back for just a moment, uh, for orange stems. And we're gonna see a little bit more of them later. But again, those branches are cut and we will use them in containers to add a vertical aspect, uh, sometimes to give structure and support uh, and the spring winds that batter and can really move plants around. But also early in the spring, we occasionally have to put frost blankets and frost tarps out on our plants. And it's so much better to lay it over the branches. It forms a bit of a teepee, a structure, uh, so that the frost blankets are not laying on the plants themselves. And if they color coordinate with the combinations, so much the better. Another glimpse at the Chanticleer Terrace a few years back, uh, early spring, uh, you can see a white tulip out there and um, one of the old uh, greenhouse cinerarias, uh, that wonderful blue. So that was a strong blue and white scheme. Um, I just actually really just love that combination. I saw the image and I wanted to see it again. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out in that bed of tulips, you will just see the upper edges of two concrete containers with plants in them. Those are cycads, cycas revoluta, uh, not hardy native to Madagascar, does not tolerate winter in the mid-Atlantic at all. However, it is another one of those plants that is frost tolerant. It tolerates quite a bit of cold. So that's a plant that I will bring out early in the season, tolerating the frost that will easily transition into summer and then back again in fall when the night's cool, just as happy. All I have to do is take it in the winter time. So I like to mix 
conventional spring bedding plants uh, with some of these more interesting, what I call bones of the garden, but cool tolerant plants. I had mentioned that Salix flame. Here's another case where we're using the flame with some of the stock, uh, but you begin to see the orange glow on those stems. This is David at work again. He wrapped these up two years ago, an empty blue glazed vessel, okay? Nothing in the pot, but he just took those stems and he wired them together at the base and again, gathered, the, gathered them together at the top. And I just love the effect. Long before anything was happening in that pot, that pot was alive, it was on fire. And uh, just, it's interesting how we who have to recreate every season, look for new and different things and where we get inspiration. Um, it's fun, it's a challenge, uh, but it's really rewarding when it works. Same idea, just a little more simple, a little, a little bird's nest, if you will, a little surround, uh, in this case, some early muscari, um, you know, a little precursor to the tulips that we're going to pop up in that pot later on. But it's the vibrancy of that orange stem willow. It just adds a little something until the flowers are ready to happen. Yet again, violas, Carex everillo, I believe it is in there. If I'm not mistaken, that's some pale yellow snapdragon, a wonderful sort of copper tone. Actually, it is a copper container, a copper tone container with a patina of a blue on there. But again, uh, in this case, either salix or maybe yellow stem dogwood. Actually, that's uh, pussy willow, French pussy willow. Uh, but the stems adding that vertical structure in that pot early in the season, long before the plants have really filled the pot. Back to that kitchen courtyard that we've seen. So we've seen that hanging basket now interpreted in cool season vegetables, beets, parsleys, mustards, lettuce. Oh, what else do we have in there? All sorts of things. Um, but that is a container that will hang in there um, all through the springtime and into early summer before it begins to bolt and gets a bit tatty. Because that courtyard, it gets good morning light, but then it's relaxed into um, afternoon shade. So none of those plants are stressed by the heat of late spring and early summer. And they can extend longer and uh, useful uh, longer into the season. Just to the left, uh, there are those copper containers I had referred to earlier on. And see that willow in there? That's one of the twisted willows. Again, not even leafed out. It just adds a little structure, a little something more to that combination until the plants really take over. All right. I also like to use that twisted willow in the uh, sort of... Um, I don't want to say white walls, uh, but the ivory walls, uh, stucco walls in those courtyards, because the silhouettes, I think, really pop. And then just the shadows it creates are wonderful. Another season, another combination of vegetables. This time in a, in a fairly simple box we had assembled of cypress um, and just, just rows of vegetables. In this case, uh, bull's blood beet and a strawberry. Just the combination of the two together Beats up, strawberries, pendulous out the side. A little bit later in the season. Just the simplicity and elegance of that combination was so strong and it yielded beet greens, beetroot, and strawberries for us to eat. Okay, what a simple and great combination and it looked beautiful the whole time doing it. Then we ran out of space. My friend Jonathan and I, uh, we uh, figured out that if we could get them up on the roof, they'd do even better. So we assembled a few more containers, had the same combinations. Uh, I think he tucked a few more things into the, uh, the upper pots. But again, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a disease, it's a sickness, and we all have it. And we keep looking for more opportunities to uh, enjoy and, and, and uh, employ these ideas. An old disused colander, kohlrabi, rosemary, thyme, and a kale. Nothing more than that. In that kitchen courtyard, it ties in with the kitchen theme, the culinary theme, the colors, the textures, the combinations. It's fun, it's whimsical, it's dependable, and it works all through our spring. Cabbages, rosemaries, nasturtium, thymes, and some branches. In a low pot, just texturally, love it, okay? Nice morning sun, 
cool um, shade in the afternoon allows them to extend <clears throat> through the springtime into the early summer, at which point, as I mentioned, we'll switch over entirely to our summer displays. But again, all of this in containers. None of these are in-ground situations, all contained. I've been using some of the large, um, they call them the fire pots. You can, you can see them, you can find them at different places. Um, we purchased a series of eight or 10 of them, big copper, I think 30, 30 inches across by about eight or 10 inches deep fire pots. I took those copper pots and drilled holes in the middle of them for drainage. Um, and I began to force tulips in them. This was a combination I just really enjoyed. Um, it's a tulip called Cretaceous. Uh, it's one of the peony flower tulips, thick, abundant flowers. I mean, just almost vulgar, but if it wasn't for them being orange, I would really have a problem with them. But just wonderful in bud, wonderful in bloom with that underplant of muscari, like I say, before the tulips really kicked in. And again, these are in containers. If you look at the left-hand shot, all the way at the base, you can just see the outer edge of that, um, that copper pot, that uh, fire pit. Just looking down into that pit. Tulipa Cretaceous. It was a real performer. Uh, would love to use it again. Uh, but you can see the blend from yellows to oranges to reds. That is the blend that is Cretaceous. Cretaceous is no one of those colors. It is the blend of those colors when you buy that tulip. I touched on Muscari, real workhorse for us in the season. Um, this is in the ruined garden at Chanticleer. This was an old coal ladder, uh, they called them. This is many, many years ago when furnaces were coal fired. If you had a furnace on the first, or excuse me, on the second or third floor, furnace, um, you would have coal delivered to the basement and these and the coal ladder, this little chain with little cups would carry the coal up to uh, the, the upper floor furnace. And uh, we took them a few years ago, uh, took a blowtorch, blew holes in each little, each little scoop so it would drain. Uh, but muscari in the springtime and generally the gardener puts uh, succulents in there in the off season. So this is ingenuity, finding things that you have that are containers, vessels of a sort, and really working with them and pushing the limit. As we ease into our summer display, this is another plant that I like to use for those early seasons. Uh, bring it out early, frost tolerant. This is Formium 10X, the New Zealand flax. Uh, not winter hardy, not by any means, but very cold tolerant in the springtime and again in the fall and wonderfully structural all through the season. A friend of mine, a friend of mine's garden in Rhode Island, um, those, uh, those leaves are anywhere between 36 to 42 inches long, a dramatic um, punctuation point in the garden, if you will. And, um, but what did he do? He inverted terracotta pots underneath of it and brought it up even higher. So I, I enjoyed how he sort of exaggerated their height already. Playing on that idea of um, punctuation and architecture, uh, just another little pocket, another season. Uh, Strelitzia, Juncia. Strelitzia is the, um, um, drawing an absolute blank right now. The, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interior foliage plant that occasionally blooms. And uh, this is a selection called Juncia. And if you look at the very top, they have tiny, tiny little dwarfed leaves. So most of that vertical, those lines are the petioles, the stems of the leaves and completely underdeveloped leaflets at the very tip. It's more of just a, a I call them FBI plants for botanical interest only. Plant geeks just love to share that stuff. Um, pretty much cutting edge and ugly plant technology, but the form is there, the punctuation, the vibrancy and the energy. Bromeliads um, in that large urn up there. We're gonna see more of uh, Alcantara imperialis rubra. Uh, it's the big bromeliad. It's the biggest one that we can get our hands on at this point in the industry. Um, not at all, winter hardy, no chance, but it is a bromeliad and they are tough, tough, tough plants. They will tolerate really lousy conditions, really small root zones, as you can see, and reward us with just beautiful architecture and color and impact. Um, this picture just is a, a real, good, um, real good example of how I work. It's not that I am a florophobe. I, um, 
I do like flowers. I just really enjoy foliage. And I've always felt that if your garden has a very good foliar background, if there's a cultural situation where the uh, flowers just don't bloom very well, if you have a good foliar background, your garden will be successful. I think I see a lot of energy, a lot of impact in this combination right here, and there's not a flower to be seen. Uh, flowers aren't necessary. They're wonderful compliments, but have the courage to try a foliar combination and run with that. So I just want to touch on a few things. <clears throat> we all have sun, you know, many of us have sunny conditions, many of us have shade conditions. It just does a few little tips and pointers and ideas uh, for either one of those. So I'd like to start out with fun in the sun. Those very same large urns, um, I think we all have garden something like that from time to time. Uh, we don't use them all the time in Chanticleer. They're a bit traditional for us, but every once in a while, you just want to, you want to go with something traditional. Um, I did this year, took those urns, very quickly filled them with the, um, the, 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 uh, the majesty palm, excuse me, um, very commonly available. I, I, one of the things I've learned at Chanticleer is you can spend a lot of money and a lot of resources and really set up a lot of deals to get some really interesting palms. But for most of our guests, a palm is a palm is a palm. It really is. So I've, I've gone with the majesties. Um, they are available. They are cost effective. They grow wonderfully in the mid Atlantic and they give all of the palm impression that I want to give. All right. What I do then is I put the emphasis on the other plants, uh, just a just a nice hot season combination all in that urn. Uh, so the bedding under the urn is relatively simple, but the energy is up in the containers. Another year, uh, similar to that one that we saw earlier on, I was growing uh, succulents. I really wanted to put an emphasis on succulents in containers, mainly because I was trying to lessen my, um, my footprint, if you will, uh, lessen my use of water, because we water our containers pretty much every day. But I wanted to lessen that, uh, the, uh, the, the necessity of watering. So I went with uh, succulents in combinations. Well, it's a good theory. It just also turned about turned out to be the wettest summer we had ever had in history in, in the Delaware Valley. <clears throat> so many of the succulents, I, they did okay. Uh, some of them actually rotted a little bit. Um, so not the greatest year to try that experiment, but it was an interesting experiment nonetheless. Those very same urns as an example. One of the reasons why I like to use these urns at Chanticleer is they're very heavy. They're very heavy and they're very large. So heavy translates to stability, which is important when you have guests in the garden, liability issues, obviously. Um, but we have summer thunderstorms, as you do. And I want that sort of stability in the garden, excuse me, uh, well, in the containers in the garden. Um, I like the size because it gives you a lot of container to hold a lot of compost um, growing medium, all right? Good water holding capacity. These plants are gonna dry out terribly quickly. Those are all good things for plant establishment. And I like those black containers <clears throat> for some of my heat loving plants because when the sun hits those containers, it warms the soil and those containers move earlier in the season than, the than those plants in the ground, that the ground is still cool. All right, but notice how I have that yellow Lysimachia tra trailing down the front of that. That is a plant that will grow and as summer increases, it will begin to shade that container and take some of that heat away from it in the summer once those plants have established. But it's the energy involved in just a few weeks. There's that Incente ventricosum that I had talked about earlier, the very same pot. And just see how that giant urn is completely swallowed by the Lysimachia, the coleus in between, and the impact of that insette is without compare. It's just, we have the heat and humidity of summer in the Delaware Valley. Let's use the tools that we have to our advantage. Pound for pound, there's always somebody out there who's just starting. And for many of us, you know, cannas and bananas, oh, we've heard this, cannas and bananas, we've heard this. If you're just starting out and you haven't heard this, pound for pound, cannas are really one of the best container plants, in my humble opinion, for container gardening when you're just starting out. There's such a variety of them out there and they are so dependable and they work so hard for us. Give them a try. If it really is your first step, take a step with cannas. 
and then build on those successes. I'm sure you're going to have them. One of my favorite uh, plants uh, shown here in the foreground, Milianthus major, the South African honeybush, not at all uh, winter hardy for us, but again, loves cool spring, loves cool autumns. Takes a little bit of a siesta in the summertime, just sort of slows down, but wonderfully textural plant. We'll see it in other combinations elsewhere. But I also wanted to point out, this is one of those rare opportunities where uh, we, we showed a little restraint and that sometimes the containers can be left vacant, all right? Maybe it is a vessel like this oil jar that has such a commanding presence that to plant it would actually take away from it. So we used it as a foil unplanted and put the emphasis in the plantings around that container. Now I like to say, if you can't take the heat, well, get out of the sun. Uh, we do have shady pockets in the garden too, just a little shady combination. The Arsini below, the Abutilons off to the right, uh, Crotons, a wonderful selection of Crotons that are coming out of Southeast Asia now. They're more than just those house plants that used to grow for years and a red foliage hibiscus in this case, an easy combination that in the shade still gives that much color variation and energy um, to the combination. I dabbled a little bit, right? I didn't dabble. I mentioned a little bit about bromeliads. Um, some bromeliads, there's such a, a wide range of bromeliads, so we should really experiment with many of them. Off to the left, the bilbergias, these wonderful like tube-like Bromeliads, just strange plants. And if nothing else, they are so fun to grow and have people react to them. Uh, the Sertanthus, the tiny little uh, earth stars below them. And then off to the right, the Echmia, Echmia blanchettiana exfulgens. Uh, quite a mouthful. I just like to refer to it as that bitch and orange bromeliad that I just wouldn't grow without. You put that in full sun, it just gets orange, orange, orange. And in a tall container, again, with that dichondra that I referred to earlier, spilling out the corners, I, you can't beat it. Easy peasy, and it's just dynamite in the garden. This was that water feature we saw quite a few images ago, a different season. Um, this is a bromeliad called Echmia Dean, D-E-A-N, Dean. Um, and so bromeliads in containers in the pools. Now you don't need to grow bromeliads in the water. The fact of the matter is those plants are actually in nursery pots suspended about 12 to 14 inches inside the top lip. There's quite a distance before it ever touches the water. And the only watering they got was rainfall and the occasional spritz with a hose because bromeliads do not need to be pampered. But look at the effect and that presence of plants in the water, in pots in the water. I said early on that many of these principles that I was talking about carry over to window boxes a window box of a dear friend of mine, a plantsman. Um, again, foliage, look at that combination. Yes, in fact, there is a flower in that picture. So we'll say we're not absent of flowers, <clears throat> but the, uh, the Rita's gold Boston fern, the alternate thera with those burgundy leaves, a wonderful trailer, um, the jasmine, Fiona sunrise, that chartreuse sprawling jasmine, and finally that begonia in the middle of the picture, luxuriance with those almost hand-like leaves. This is a shady pocket in this gentleman's garden. The abutilon is throwing a little flower, but it's succeeding so well with this combination of foliage. And I think it's so strong and so, it's just so effective. Um, window boxes, this could be a hanging basket, this could be a container combination. Any of those would work. These were some baskets that I welded together years ago when I was essentially learning how to weld. So don't look too carefully at the welds on there. That's just, this is the learning process. But I created these sort of triangular shaped baskets and all three of them hung from a triangular shaped apparatus um, from the uh, cherry tree that you see. But in those baskets were impatience repens, the truly pendulous impatience, not really a bloomer at all. Um, and a wonderful fuchsia that I got from Plant Delights many years ago. Um, it's one of the few fuchsias that we can grow that grows and blooms in the summer heat in the mid-Atlantic. And so I've grown it for years. It's a simple combination, but under the shade of that tree, 
um, the breeze would take those three baskets and they would just move gently in a very, very quiet little sort of orbit in relation to each other. And I, I just thought it was just a, they, this, they just kept revealing different sort of aspects of those baskets to themselves. Excuse me, to the visitor. A little close up of that fusion. Another terrace, another shady container. As you can see at Chanticleer, we go big. Scale is important for us. Um, and they, then again, many of us who garden at home like to go big too, but this is a, this is a large pot filled with caladium. Um, the, uh, the fuchsia gardenmeister bonstet, you can see at the very bottom center, uh, but with a wonderful philodendron, autumn. And I love those philodendrons for the shady, the shady areas. They're so carefree, they, they require no energy and they give a wonderful color and impact even in the shade. So I just thought those color tones work well together and it was just a big pot that made a big presence in the shady portion of the, uh, of the terrace. Some of the new cordylines that are coming out of the, uh, out of the south. Um, I'm drawing an absolute blank on that one, and the rainbow is coming to mind. But there are so many of them out there. Just begin to, you know, Google or Pinterest uh, different cordyline um, uh, fruticosa, cordyline fruticosas, and you will see different selections and different names. Look at these things. They're just dynamite, and all they want is some heat, some moisture, and some fertility, either in, you know, compost rich soil or fertility that you give it. No real flowers per se, but the vibrancy and the energy in these plants is just without compare. Okay, and I've talked about a bunch of different plants, but these are a few of those plants that I really wouldn't garden without. So again, I'm speaking more to those that don't really know where to start or just not sure which ones to start with. This is sort of a short list, okay? We talked about cannas. I am going to reinforce cannas. This is one called Tropicana. Uh, you see a very deep burgundy leaf, but with variegation. Uh, the, the pink lily is the, uh, the naked lady, the Lycoris squamidra that blooms later in the summer, happen to be blooming with this. But it's that foliage of the canna Tropicana that I love so much. So long before the flowers come, the foliage is working for you. Um, Amicia zygomeris. This is a bit of an oddball plant. Um, I went to England to discover this plant only to find out that it is a high elevation Mexican legume. So it's new world plant that I discovered in the old world. Uh, it's one of those, I don't want to say stump the chump, but you don't see it very often. But when you do, it's all about the texture of this plant the odd yellow flowers, but so much about the texture of this plant. And it's such a, it, we should always push those limits and experiment with some new things. Um, this is one that I just absolutely love growing. I talked about the Alcantaras, Imperialis rubra, for example. This is the impact that multiple of those Imperialis will do in the garden. Repeating the, the repetition with the, uh, the cord lines in the background. Um, I do like repetition in gardens, uh, but those Imperialis, they just work. Sun or shade, um, they are bromeliads, so they're really carefree, but they give such an important impact in the garden. A few other uh, bromeliads you can see, shady pockets, a dry pocket in the garden that you just don't get to very often. Think about bromeliads. It adds a little something to the area, um, but really it, it, they're, they're, they're practically carefree, okay? Experiment, give them a try. That wonderful Ecmia blanchettiana, uh, blanchettiana ex fulgens that I talked about earlier on. I wanted to highlight them, so I did put them in those tall black containers, put them out in the sun, and you can just see the impact they have in a courtyard space. The Melianthus major, I mentioned that earlier on, it is one of those plants I wouldn't garden without. You're going to have to look a little harder to find this, but it is becoming more available. And here, combined with the wonderful Salvia leucantha, that old late blooming Salvia that we probably are introduced to in our grandmother's gardens. But here's an example of combining new innovative plants 
with old favorites and for a wonderful color harmony. The silvers just carry through that. And the late season effect of those two, I think is dynamite. So that's something I'm charging all of you is to find the best of the old and combine it with the best of the new and just, just strive and try for these new combinations and have some real fun with them. Melianthus on the left with Centranthus Ruber. And then again on the right, a repeat of that shot, but you see how important that texture is in the garden. Uh, they happen to be in the ground, but just imagine that texture in containers. It is, it's out of this world. We had talked about the Insette. We see that in the background. We've talked about Cannas. Uh, you see Canna Australia in that bed. Uh, you see, I mentioned the cord lines, and you see cord line immediately behind that statue. And then you see the salvias with that burgundy. So all of a sudden, burgundy is the dominant color, manifested many different ways in flower, in foliage, uh, and in impact. And look how you can just choose a color theme and run with it. And most of that is foliage. But do keep in mind, this is a bed shot, yes, but you could take any of those elements, combine them in a container, and be just as effective. The Cyperus papyrus, the Egyptian bulrush, um, this is a plant that should be growing in, the, in, the, in, in a pond somewhere. But you know the interesting thing is you really don't see the plants reading the books. You fill that container with compost. That container stands about 30 inches tall just heavy, wet compost, and that plant is just as happy. It thinks it's on the river's edge or stream edge somewhere. But the verticality and the impact and those lines of the stems, I just think it's absolutely dynamite. Cyperus papyrus, very impactful plant in gardens. Here again, in containers along that same waterway. Look at the effect that gives. I mentioned the Formium 10X, the New Zealand flax early on. Um, just want to put in another plug for that. If you have a nice conservatory space or a cool, bright space, um, frost-free that you could overwinter a plant like this, it would be dynamite. They're absolutely fine inside in the wintertime in those cool, bright environments. Not, not tolerant of wintertime in the Delaware Valley, but you can bring them out in March and bring them back in in November. And that's a good working season for many of these plants. Here's a fun little one for the summertime. You can grow this from seed. Manihot gramanii, commonly known as the hardy tapioca. There's only two problems with that. It's not hardy and it's not tapioca. Uh, the interesting thing is the seed is hardy. Okay, and they germinate early in the season and they transplant very easily. And you'll get up to six to eight feet in one season with this plant. Um, and uh, it's related to the tapioca family and that's where the tapioca comes in. But I love it because of those leaves and the wonderful sort of parasol like shadows that it leaves uh, on your patios or areas around this plant. Another little one, Schefflera. How many of you used to grow Schefflera's as houseplants? This is a selection called Soleil, okay, sunshine. Uh, this was the hit of the TPIE, the Tropical Plant Industry Expo, Expo a few years ago, and continues just to be a wonderful summer grower. If you put this in full sun, it will likely burn a little bit, but in filtered light or in shade, it just lights up that dark condition. Schefflera Soleil. Caladiums, many different caladiums out there, a whole new selection of caladiums coming in out of Southeast Asia. Uh, this one is just absolutely dynamite. Um, the Thai Beauty, the, the pink that you see there is, is practically transparent. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this thing will burn like an Irish baby on the beach if you put it out in full sun. So this really needs to grow in the shade, uh, but there's, it's such an interesting thing. And there's, like I say, there's so many interesting caladiums coming out of the Southeast Asian area uh, that we should be using in gardens. One of my all time favorites for shade, Cissus discolor. Um, the Rex begonia vine. It is not a begonia, uh, but it gets that name because of the metallic overtones, which are similar to Rex begonias. Another look at it there. It's not really a climber, but I like to call it an opportunistic sprawler, okay? But it does all these things in the shade, whereas most vines will just lay down and sit. This, this is this color really wants to work for us in the shade. So give that one a good look too. 
I like to tribute um, some of my friends. I call this a little help from my friends and some people I don't know, um, but just inspiration. I think we always take inspiration from other areas and other avenues. Um, I just love to see what other people do with containers. Andrew Bunting, my dear friend and plantsman in, the, in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, uh, not an unfamiliar name to many of you in, in the Baltimore area. This is his back garden. And I just love the informality of his area. I was just up in his garden a few nights ago. It looks phenomenal. Every year it's something different. He juxtaposes some of these old elements and reinvents them and reincorporates them. And there's always something new coming through, but an informal um, aspect or um, an informal aspect to his garden. Love it. Thomas Hobbs in Vancouver, British Columbia. Thomas taught me so much about light and detail in my containers. Um, just a little moment on a terrace in his garden in Vancouver. Now, admittedly, it's Vancouver where you can grow any plant you want, anytime you want, impeccably. That being said, we can grow this combination here very happily. But I was really introduced to light and detail with Thomas, and I've weighed very heavily on that in my combinations uh, because of that, that introduction. Two more little terrace areas of Thomas's. Um, like I say, look at the details in those urns a little glass bauble, just the combinations, love them. Victoria Murray, again in British Columbia, very early on when I was really introduced to formiums, but just large containers in the bed. Maybe there was a bad spot, something died. Maybe it's just a mix up a bed combination, put a large container in there. When you take a plant and give it a 30 inch container, you give it a 30 inch head start, 30 inches more impact in the garden than you would um, without the container. A wonderful ventilator as a hanging basket in my dear friend's garden in Portland, Maine, uh, Portland Oregon. Uh, what's wonderful is there's a stove pipe that stands under that, not connected, but very gently that ventilator that, that is a basket will spin on the, uh, on the, the sort of virtual stove pipe beneath it. There you go. And then the ventilator on the ground spins in the breeze. A friend of mine, a gardening friend in the Philadelphia area who in the last two years has moved south, sold her wonderful garden and moved south, uh, was also an accomplished metal worker. And some of these are some of the containers that she used to weld. So an avid plants woman, but a fabulous metal worker as well. Look at these wonderful vessels that she created. And there they are planted. People are so talented. Sometimes it's knowing when to say when, which containers need to be potted up and which should just be left alone. Yeah, I wish I could figure that out too. Another little pocket at Chanticleer where I can't seem to show restraint. But some years it's very spare, some years it's very heavy. I like combinations like this because you can mix and match, you can change them up. Whereas other seasons, it's much more curated. Speaking of much more spare, this was a garden I visited in Dallas, Texas. Um, two large containers outside of that very austere uh, facade. I, I say, I always said it has a certain Auschwitzian charm to it, um, but I think those containers are in scale with the, with the size of the building and the aesthetic. But I really enjoyed going around back to see where they really let their hair down. Um, this is their little kitchen garden <laughs> and I thought, Boy, these people don't really let themselves go too much, do they? But everyone has their own style. So I just want to begin to wind this up and just say a few things that I do consider when I'm planning and planning my displays. Scale, I talked about scale. Go big, go big or go home, okay? We really need to enjoy what we do and own our aesthetic and be, have confidence in our aesthetic. No, not everyone has a big yard or a big terrace. Some of us garden on patios or just a, a balcony, but it's the scale of the combination itself, of the container, the texture, and ultimately the experience of the combination. If I were to do a few little pots in front of this big house at Chanticleer, it would be laughable. Okay, so I need to go big. So scale is critical. Carry that scale through large hanging baskets, keeping the scale, 
also the continuity of certain elements in those combinations keeps it harmonious and not chaotic. A large copper pot in a large stand, make it big, let it fill a space. Ta-da! Having the short guy next to it also gives it a certain impact as well, but scale is important. The idea of destination, no matter how big your garden is, create the idea of journey and destination. Give people a reason to travel through your garden, no matter how long that travel, that journey is, and interesting things to see along that journey. Just happened to be an intersection of the garden at the Auckland Botanic Garden, um, but it's, it's, it, it was a destination. It happened to be the intersection, but it was a visual touchstone that you made your way toward. An empty container in a garden area, all right? One of those interesting things that you passed along the journey. Our shade porch, uh, sun porch, excuse me, at Chanticleer. This is a wonderful place that you can step out of the summer sun, sit down in the shade and enjoy. And while you're enjoying with the furniture, we just fill pots with water and float blossoms, leaves, stems of whatever is blooming and whatever is interesting in the garden that day. Okay, we refresh this every day in the summertime as the water spoils pretty quickly, but it's a snapshot, a moment of what's happening in the garden. And look at the variety. We have our interns take care of this. So it's always different. It's always exciting. And it's easy to do. These are ideas that you can take home as well. Destination, an empty vessel at the end of a journey, something to harbor or bring you down close to that little stone bench in a garden. You see it in the distance, you wander over to it. There's an opportunity to sit and interact with it. Consider destination calling out to welcome you to that bench. Definitely calling you to welcome you to that bench. <laughs> detail, creating a high level of interest by maintaining a high level of detail. It's in the finish of the material, it's in the choice of the plants and the relationships of plants to their surroundings. Detail is important. This is the mantelpiece at the ruined garden at Chanticleer, the upper one. The lower one is merely a reflection of that mantelpiece in the water table below. But look at the detail. And as you get closer, that detail holds up. It's wonderful when it's detailed from a distance, but when the detail holds up close up, that is important. Look at the shadow on that container. <clears throat> Think about how light travels through your garden and how those shadows can create a level of detail. Think about sun movement through the garden. Consider that. I showed you this container from Thomas Hobbes and that little glass bauble. Think about little what little inanimate things could be added to your combinations just to make them that much more interesting. Have fun with this, explore and experiment. A little reflective globe in there, but look what it does with those silvers. Seashells thrown in with some succulents giving an almost under the sea look. Innovation, we talked about being creative with our vessels, using ordinary things in an extraordinary manner, plants, elements, and the presentation of those. The teacup courtyard, the main area that I garden, many different years, many different manifestations. I didn't know what to, different things, but <clears throat> I hadn't done this before, aquatics. Large containers set into that garden filled with aquatic plants. Never did it before. Absolutely wonderful. Had a great time with it. They love the heat and humidity of our mid-Atlantic summers and perform beautifully. Remember those uh, fire pots I was talking about, those copper fire pots? Well, after I finished with the mulbs, I fabricated stands and I took them up to five foot tall, four foot tall, and two foot tall, so that they were at different levels. And these combinations just succeeded wonderfully, but changed the perspective. So you looked into the combinations, not down on them. There is a vibe, there's a, there's a huge array of containers out there available to us, different fits and different finishes. This is quite strident, quite vibrant for my liking, but you know, it may be what you want. 
Maybe at the end of the day, you want to come home to something a little bit more subdued. Look at the combination, excuse me, the, uh, the fits and finishes of containers out there. Pick the one that's right for you. Instead of growing things that are pendulous and letting them spill, why don't you make a wire cage and run them up? Jasminum Fiona Sunrise. Never knew it would grow to eight feet tall in a cage, but it did happily. Innovation in how we grow our plants is another way to consider it. A little succulent table in our home garden. This little hens and chicks, easy, easy, easy to maintain. But I cast that vessel a few years ago and put small, three small pockets where I can insert little copper pipes and set a glass tabletop on top of it. So when the guests come over, we can have our cocktails, we can have our nibbles. And of course, the guests will still reach under the glass and pull the weeds. It's reflexive. There's no getting around that. But look at that. It works. We live with it. We love it. Innovation. Same courtyard garden at home. Just iron, uh, not iron, steel, uh, steel shelves that I bolted onto that wall years ago. And every day, excuse me, every season, a different combination of three plants. This year, Sansevieria. Um, this past year, it was palms. Uh, just wonderful stages. Different way to change that perspective of plants from the normal spot in the garden where we see them. Just an old pedestal with the carex spilling down, spilling down onto the ground with more carex. Presentation. An old log, an old log wired together, rotten so much that really the bark was the only thing that was intact and filled with agaves and succulents for a summer season. From a distance, it was absolutely stunning. Close up, you could see the mechanics, but it was really one of those things that you really only saw from a distance. Easy to take care of, fun and innovative. This is Seattle, Washington, one of the houseboat communities. These people don't even have gardens. They don't have land. It doesn't stop them. It's innovation and creativity that allow them to garden in this manner with this enthusiasm on a houseboat in a lake in Seattle. But it's out there. Look at the different things that you can do with found object, popping out of a subway stop in Brooklyn, Core 10 steel containers right on the street side. Look at that. Contemporary, proportionate, the scale is right, innovative, all the things we're talking about. And lastly, repetition. The repetition of color or texture of the plant or of a theme. Repetition really reinforces your aesthetic, okay? It's harmonious, it's not chaotic, and it really gives to the confidence of your aesthetic. It also gives you the opportunity to sort of manage people within your garden, as if to say, no further, please don't look beyond this. Something happened, utility, whatever the reason is. Um, but you have the opportunity of sort of discreetly saying, thank you, but no further, move on. But I do like repetition in the gardens at Chanticleer. I, rep I repeat, um, whether it's the plant combination or maybe it's the color and texture of the vessel, there generally is a theme that carries through so that the displays don't always seem chaotic. One from a few years ago, of course, the orange, I love it, but I call it my beets and bellas combination. Uh, Tulip Princess Irene with beets, bull's blood beet and bellas perennis in the combination. But just jump back, it's the repetition of that that I felt was so strong. Another year, another combination, rhubarb and a burgundy tulip. Beautiful, isn't it? But consider the size and even in a small garden, repetition. Repetition, that staircase. It soothes the eye, it reinforces the aesthetic. The Getty Museum. Massive facility, giant staircase. Look at those pots, vast vessels, simple plant combination, pendulous rosemary and elysium. However, in a very informal array. Repetition, simple, informally displayed. 
And I think many people just need to be realistic. This was an artist. She said, I am not a gardener. I don't want to be a gardener, but I want something green. And I thought this was a really proportionate response to horticulture and her desires to garden. So this really wraps up our discussion. Think about what containers can bring to our gardens, the plants that are in them, the impact those plants and pots have in our garden. Think of the theatrical, the, the, uh, theatrical aspect of our gardens in that way. And for many of us in containers, it's a seasonal thing. If it doesn't work, we'll regroup and try it again differently next season, but enjoy, experiment, have fun and enjoy. Sometimes it's the empty vessel or sometimes it's something from the garden yourself. So I wanna leave you with this thought. <clears throat> Never ever become complacent in your designs, your dreams, or your garden. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was a pleasure to speak to you today. I wish I could have been there in person, um, but it just didn't work out that way. So uh, um, let's see. I think I'm going to wrap up here and I'm going to step back and let Cheryl take over. All right. Thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. We enjoyed that a lot and we have a, quite a few questions. Um, okay, if you give me just one moment, I'm going to step up. I'm going to turn on a light so you can actually see me. Sounds good. I'll be right back. Okay. For those of you still sticking with us, I put a couple um, messages in our chat box, if you're able to open that. Um, information on Dan, if you want to find out some more info on him and other programs that he does, it's danbenarsik.com. And I put a link in there also for the mill, the millstores.com. You can check that out there. Um, we have a few questions and a few of them are similarly themed. So I'm going to group them together at the end. I'm going to jump to the other ones first. The first one was early on when we, we talked about melianthus quite a bit. Um, the question is, is it possible to root melianthus? It is possible to root melianthus. Uh, what you want to do is take the early shoots from the base. Melianthus will develop a thick woody stem, a brown woody stem. Um, it's too late once it goes brown and woody. So look for new shoots, all right? A supple green shoot um, is the best to root. Although, as I mentioned, availabilities are getting better with melianthus and often you can actually find the mail order or even regionally available. Great. How about poppies? Um, let's see, I lost it. Where did it go? Sorry. <laughs> um, the poppies are in part shade. Don't they need full sun? And how long do they last in pots? They are in part shade, filtered light. Um, if they are in full sun at Chanticleer, the problem is they are also in full wind in the springtime. All right. So we actually intentionally brought them back into that little shady pocket, but that shady pocket gets good morning and early afternoon light. That was late in the afternoon when I shot that image where it is in, in a fully shade situation. So it was a little bit of a misnomer. There's more light in that corner than that image um, gave, gave the idea. Gotcha. Thanks. Best, best bloom, they'll, they'll bloom the best in the sun but consider the wind in the springtime. Great. Um, how about aquatic plants? Are they difficult to maintain for you? The, the aquatics plants? you said? Yeah. As I mentioned, that was a first year endeavor for me. I had never grown them before and I was surprised how easy and carefree they were. Um, I thought there was gonna be a lot of care. I thought I was gonna to have to rely on a lot of resources and, and people in the area. And the fact of the matter is I did have a few questions from professionals, but for the most part, they took care of themselves. They thrived, they really did. The only addition I did was added a few um, fish, the mosquito eaters and the guppies, just to manage mosquitoes. Um, and more so, that was pressure from visitors. They were very concerned about mosquitoes. So I told them there were fish in there eating the larvae and they were fine with that. But truly the plants, they, they really did, they took care of themselves in many ways. Um, the remaining questions deal a lot with overwintering them. Um, over, do you overwinter your tropicals? And then what do these tropicals need to overwinter? Kind of, what kind of light, what kind of water do they need? Sure. Okay. A, a big broad based question. So at Chanticleer, we have holding houses that is overwintering houses. Okay. So everybody says, oh, that's great. I don't have that. Mm -hmm. Well, there are six of us trying to jam plants in those holding houses. We call them the lifeboats. And once the lifeboat is full, there's no more room. The doors close. 
What that means is we can't overwinter everything. So we put the high value, the difficult plants in the glass house for overwintering. But for many of us that this question really pertains to, cannas, bananas, elephant ears, so many gingers, so many of those plants uh, will go through a nice dark dormancy without any problem at all. That is to say, cannas and gingers, I let frost freeze them back, cut them off at the ground, fork them up and put them into a bulb crate. And um, I sort of I wrap up, I take, I take a, one of those big black garbage bags and put it in the bulb crate first, take the rootstock, the corms of the gingers and the cannas, dig them out of the ground, shake off most of the soil, cut them back, put them in those crates, fold the plastic over it and put it in a frost-free environment. They will be absolutely fine next spring. The many of the bananas and the insetes that I that we saw earlier uh, can be lifted. The leaves and the pseudostem, the, the leaves and the petioles cut off so they look like a big telephone pole. I take those same big black garbage bags and I slide them into those garbage bags and I lay them in a dark basement. Okay. If you can, you can stand them up as well. The key is dark, dark. They're phototropic. That is to say, if there's a light signal, they will try to grow toward that light signal. Um, so that's cannas, bananas, uh, gingers, um, elephant ears. Um, some of them overwinter as, as the bulbs themselves, the corms, um, but many of them need to grow all through the season. So often it's just as easy to buy your elephant ears fresh every season. And with availabilities, it's become very easy and cost effective. Great, you answered three questions in that one. Someone also threw in the question about the cannas, so you got that one covered, thank you. Um, another one is about the bulbs um, in your containers. Do you plant them in the fall and then overwinter them? Yes, we do. We plant them. I'll be planting them up whether at the same time I'm planting in ground, I will, I, we will force our container combinations at Chanticleer or bulb combinations. Uh, we do have cold frames that we sink quite a few of these, uh, but those larger copper vessels that I was talking about, I actually put those into an unheated garage. Mm -hmm. So they froze solid in the winter time because they're a large mass and I want to keep those frozen uh, and cooled, cooled way down. And uh, so, and basically they were so big, they couldn't fit in the cold frame without me making all of my coworkers really angry. Uh, but they did perfectly in the unheated garage and they woke up and I brought them out and they just exploded just as you saw them. So yes, we pot up our container, bulb container combinations in the autumn. Great. I think that's it for the visitors. I had a question. So what about the containers themselves? What do you do to to prepare them for the winter and store them away? Yeah, we, we have policy at Chanticleer. We, um, we essentially dismantle and empty every container at Chanticleer. And yes, some of those are frost free and some of them are winter tolerant. Yeah, I don't believe it. <laughs> so we, we all, um, like I say, we have a big inventory of pots, but we have a big inventory because we take care of those pots. They are, they are emptied out, they are rinsed out and stored. Um, in a, in a basement of one of the buildings, but it's not necessary that it be warm as long as they're out of the weather. And generally we invert the containers so that their tails are, uh, their bottoms are up and um, just give good air circulation and they're generally fine that way. Great, thank you. I think mm -hmm. we've covered them all. Like That's I said, I, go ahead, Dan. I'm like sorry? I said, we put your website on um, everyone's uh, chat box if you got a chance to see that. And if you haven't sure. been to Chanticleer, I know quite a few have. I've been there several times. You've got to make a trip up there several times of the year, just like at Ladue. Everything's always changing, and there's some very whimsical things similar to Ladue. Um, you definitely got to check it out. So um, right. thank you all so much. Thank you, Dan. We loved talking to you and hearing from you, and we hope to see you in person um, sooner than later. We hope so, too. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And ladies and gentlemen, this was my first Zoom presentation, so hopefully it will. Wow, work. good job. Oh, wait, one more thing. Muffin, your dear friend Muffin just threw in a question. She said, who was your photographer for your artwork, for your, for your images? <laughs> most of them were mine. Most nice, of them. Nice. Very few were our co-workers, but most of them were mine. Very good. Very good. All right, thanks again, Dan. If anybody else wants to stick around, I have a couple quick announcements um, for you. So Dan, you're feel, feel free to kind of mute yourself and, and, and move on your way. We appreciate it again. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you very much. All Take right. Care all. all right, those of you still sticking around, just a couple quick things. Thank you again to our sponsors, The Mill, 
to um, the Manda Conservancy, to Muffin and Sam Dow, and for Jet Rock. Um, our last lecture is next week. Can you believe it? The fall is flying by so fast. Our lecture next Thursday at 4 p.m. is with Tom Shearer on interior design. So please check us out for that. Our virtual garden glow is kicking off this Saturday at 7 p.m. It's um, gonna be on our website. We're sending an e-blast out tomorrow with information, but basically it's a link on our website. And if you can't catch it this Saturday, it's gonna be um, available on our website through the end of November. And then lastly, again, if you wanna get one last look at Ladue, we are open for um, two more weekends, this weekend and next weekend. Again, Thursday through Monday. Um, 9 a.m. till 3, and we actually have an in-person art show. We've been doing virtual all season, but we do have an in-person art show in the barn studio and gallery. It's beautiful. It's such a great combination of different forms of art, different artists that we've had over the seasons. Um, you'll love it. And again, that's open during our open hours, Thursday through Monday. It is a shorter open time that it is uh, viewing uh, availability. It's uh, 11 a.m. till 2. Um, so please come check us out for that. In the meantime, have a great week and I hope to see some of you next week, uh, Thursday at 4 p.m. Take care, everybody. Good night.